and welcome to the Organic Gardening Podcast. My name is Sarah Brown and I'm joined by Chris Collins. This month's episode is all about how to encourage wildlife into your garden. Organic growers recognise that all forms of life have their place in the growing area, from bats to bees, frogs, birds, beetles and spiders. Everything is part of the natural order. And us growers, we have the privilege to witness it all. Chris interviews one of the country's best wildlife gardening experts, Kate Bradbury, who's full of tips and ideas on how to bring wildlife into your plot. I loved hearing how she first got interested in wildlife gardening. And our post bag this month brings up topical questions about what diseased plant material is safe to throw on the compost heap and what isn't, how to deal with the devastating allium leaf miner, and Chris gets lyrical on creating a pond. So wherever you are listening, I hope you enjoy this November episode. Hi Sarah, how are you? <laughs> I'm very well, Good. thank you. Here we are in actually a slightly cold potting shed because we're well into the cold season. <laughs> we are, now, aren't yes. We? Jack Hackett's and scarves time, this <laughs> yeah, Sarah. Yeah, exactly. Well, I had my first frost last week, yeah. minus two degrees, so yeah. it's a sign of things to come, isn't Certainly, it? Certainly, the seasons changed. I was liking it. You know what's been a brilliant year for actually this year? It's been dahlia, and there's been loads of dahlias on my allotment site, and been very, very beautiful. And Suddenly they've all just gone black, and it's kind of that says to me there's been one frost. It says to me seasons changed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that's so true. Yeah. And it's also a time when I'm definitely clearing a lot out. I'm preparing mm. for winter, so I'm getting rid of quite a lot of dead and diseased material. And we'll be coming on to that actually in in our questions at the end. What to do with this diseased material? But because the theme of this month's podcast is about wildlife in the garden, I think we need to think about how yeah. important that material is actually. It's very interesting because there's a garden. I think a gardener by nature is quite a tidy, quite a fussy person. You know, you like things to be in order because you're dealing with nature. You have to have a plan, a strategy. And when I started in gardening, everything was about tidiness. You clip the edge of the grass and you tidy this, you tidy that. It's in a way, a garden has to let go a little bit because it's, it's the garden's not just for us, it's for nature. And I think you need to kind of you need to take your hands off the rain a bit this year and have a little bit of wood pile, have, leave a bit of leaves here and there and, and just think about the other visitors, the other occupants of the area. Yeah, because it's their garden as much as it is. Exactly, yours. yeah. And if you can leave those twigs and those leaves, then something will crawl in there, hibernate in there. It's giving them somewhere safe to then, they can come out early in the year and they will probably be dealing with the pests that will also appear. So if you have a hedgehog that crawls in, Mm -hmm. he will come out and eat the slugs, for instance. So yes, don't be too tidy, you're quite right. I think you need to let it go a little bit. Relax, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I think actually (laughs) God's about life, isn't it? So you don't want to be fighting that, you want to be encouraging it. Well, that's the organic principle of working with nature, isn't it? Um, We talked last month about making leaf mould. So if you want to know more about that, dear listener, then go back to our October podcast but definitely I suspect people are busy making it. Yeah, there's plenty of it. I love the idea we said before of having the community leaf hold uh, mold stations, you know, if you can get one in a on an allotment space or in a park where people can contribute, collect leaves. Mm. Kids love that. Take the kids down the park, collect leaves, put them in a in yeah. the leaf mold. I just think that's a great activity for a community to do and obviously very beneficial because you'll have yeah. nice organic seed sowing compost in a couple of years that's very true and the other thing I've I've noticed that I've got some woody branches and cuttings and things things that I again I cut back maybe at this time of year and a lot of people have asked what actually do I do with that woody Mm. stuff it's too big to go on the compost heap I think there are probably two ways you can approach this if you've got a shredder you can shred them and while they're wet they will still shred well If you know someone with a shredder, even better, don't go and buy one. Just say, could you possibly borrow it? Share a shredder. That's not easy to say. Um, But if you don't want to shred, then maybe just allow these woody bits to rot naturally. I was going to say, actually, we're really not. If you've got a good pair of sacketeers, cut them into small sections, into small pieces, and make a nice big log pile with them. Yeah. You know, so you'd be quite artistic if you want. You know, you can get a little square metre in your border or in your garden where you've got an area. And just cut them up, stack them up, and let that let that over to wildlife. It will rot naturally, but it's going to take a long time yeah. because wood does, and it's full of carbon, and, and it's going to be tough to die down. You can speed that up if you want to by adding nitrogen to mm. the pile. And how are you going to do that? You can wee on it. <laughs> you can... I might get arrested for that. <laughs> <laughs> you can make it's also uncomfortable. <laughs> you can make a tea from sea nettles mm. that's full of nitrogen. This nitrogen is going to help the the, the carbon 
happen to break down. So make sure that it's wet with some sort of nitrogen, even actually lawn cuttings if you've got any yeah. left over or any grass cuttings. And then maybe by next summer, you will have something that will make a good mulch around shrubs, not necessarily to dig into the soil. But just but to lay on the top. top. Yeah, yeah. And so we're avoiding fires, are we, Sarah? That's quite important, the burning. I think that's appropriate because if you're going to burn wood, you're releasing a whole lot of carbon into the air. Right. It's not a good idea. I personally would avoid. Right, okay. That's, that's interesting because you'd think of it as organic, but actually you're right, it does release yes. uh, into the atmosphere stuff that we don't want that's going to help yes. yeah, yeah yeah having a fire gives you ash of course wood ash yeah. and that that can be beneficial but in principle i think I right okay it. Now then, if you've got roses, they're probably looking a little spindly at yeah. the moment. I don't know, do you have any roses? <laughs> I do, I have them on the balcony even, actually. Oh, I have some, right. Yeah, yeah, um, I have Albertine on the balcony, one Is of my favourite. you haven't got on your balcony? Well, it's balcony very crowded. Well, I've had to clean it out a bit, actually, because it's like... inspiration. Well, it's say. just like, I've had to have a big tidy up on there, because it like all gardeners, you go, oh, I'll put that, I'll put that, and then sometimes you have to go, hang on a minute, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, but yeah, I, mean, I love Albertine, I don't know, an old rose called yes. Albertine. I used to plant that in Tokyo when I worked in Tokyo, I used to put it on the side of skyscrapers, 10 floors up and they still did the business. And they've a really, really beautiful, beautiful plant. Uh, but they do start to look a bit sad after they've given you this huge show. They do look a bit sad. And obviously we're going to need to be concerned with wind rock because they're quite loosely rooted roses, yes. um, especially if you're growing hybrid teas and stuff. And they will rock in the wind and you'll then prone to disease and stuff. So I would now be looking to cut those down yeah. by two thirds, actually. I'll take them down quite, it's quite hard for that. And any um, climbing rows to stop the wind getting into them, I'd be going into thinning out any whippy sort of stuff that will cross the wood. I would probably start putting that out as well. Yeah, I agree, exactly. That's exactly what I'm doing. And also, if you've got black spot, collect up the leaves under the rose bush and don't put them on the compost heap. Don't leave them on the soil because that fungal infection will get in there and stay there. Collect it up and put it in your domestic waste collection, green waste collection. Then that will go off when to, uh, to the, if the council take that, they'll go off to a professional composting site where they can actually get the right temperatures to destroy it. Exactly, yeah. Chris. And again, we'll come on to this later in the question and answer session where we talk about what's safe to put on the compost even what isn't. But definitely black spot. <laughs> yeah. Don't don't go there. <laughs> and in the greenhouse, I'm having a lovely clear out. No. It was pouring with rain the other day. And it was very nice being in the greenhouse, just sorting out everything that I... It, would, it was full of happy memories, actually, of all the seeds that I'd sown in the mm. summer and all the little plants that were coming on. I've now cleared all that out, so it's ready for winter. I think that will also help prevent any pests and diseases yeah. overwintering in that sheltered space. Don't take the spiders out, though. No, you need the spiders. They're nice little predators, <laughs> but I think that's a useful... Yeah, I think so, yeah, to, to have a good clean-out, because you don't want fungal spores overwintering in there, etc. And, uh, and it's such a, 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 um, a private place, in a little way, a greenhouse, because it's you and you and the gardening, isn't it? It's very kind of one-to-one, -one, I always feel. If you're not, if you haven't got a greenhouse, a lot of people have these little sort of lean-tos or little sort of um, greenhouses they might put against the side. Well, same rule applies. Give them a good clean-out, make sure they're nice and tidy. I think it's also part of the mentality the gardening mentality in November which is reflecting on what you've grown in the past year what worked what didn't yes. work and then that helps you to make plans for what you're going to grow next year yeah I think almost like a bridge isn't it between the two I always find it in a little way this time of year you're thinking about what you've grown and in a little way your head's thinking about what's coming and you're and another little job I've been doing but it always pays off I have a lot of chives which have self-seeded onto the gravel paths and I'm digging them up now and potting them and putting them into the greenhouse because then I can go on cutting chives all the Yeah, I love, really I love chives. Them. They're very good for the bees as well, the chives. They, 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 they love it, yeah. Flower, Do you yes. know what I've got on my allotment that's seeded everywhere is walnuts. It's been a really big year for oh, walnuts. Wow. And so I'm looking at them, they've sprung up here and there. Walnuts. So I might, I might even have a crack at trying to bonsai one. I don't know. It's oh. It seems a shame just to dig them out, doesn't it? Yes, you're going to have a big tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, I can't leave them there. So, yeah, yeah it's just to say, how do I utilise one or two of them? Because I just think it's uh, apparently the best time to eat them is when they crack, and I think around November is maybe the time they might do that. Yeah. Oh, Chris, that sounds delicious. Walnuts and chestnuts on your <laughs> open fire. Sounds great. Um, I've had the first frost at home, and frosts are definitely going to be with us from now on. How, what have you got on your allotment that needs protecting, and how do you protect it? A lot of my stuff dies down, to be honest, but I do have uh, um, some plants that I would look to protect, maybe some of my sort of new fruit bushes I've put in, sort of whipped fruit I've put in recently. I think a mulch is a great idea. 
I just mm. think, no, the mulch that will sit on top, round the plant, protect mm. those surface roots that are collecting the oxygen, that are breathing and collecting the oxygen. That's certainly a good idea. If you're a bit more exotic and you're growing tree ferns and stuff in your garden, then I remember um, when I lived up north, you'd obviously wrap them in hessian. That was a big thing. You'd wrap up the leaves. In fact, I was recently, about a month ago, I was in Spain, and they do it with all the palms on the seafront. They wrap them in hessian. They wrap them up just to protect them from that nippy weather, yeah. Of course, the danger is that you create a cold, wet environment, yes. which is actually... Uh, the kiss of death well, to a lot of hot plants, especially yeah. in the Mediterranean. Well, actually, what they do is they just pack it with straw, and I think that's to avoid, like, a good, good example. I've done a few, I'm going to give a tip here to the listeners. It's the Logan Botanic Garden, east coast of Scotland. Yes. It has a beautiful line of tree ferns and avenues. It's incredible. And what they do, as I remember right, is they pack it with straw all around the crown and then put the hessian wrap round. And I think that must be to stop that water sitting in the crown and prevent rotting. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm. And it's also the same with um, your Mediterranean herbs that are in pots or in the ground. It's sitting in wet, cold they water. Like, that's, what you that's, get, what they don't, that's what will kill yeah. you, not the frost. No, man, right you, get, you get psychological drought where the plant looks fine. So, yeah, but if it's sitting in wet all winter, then come the spring, when you expect it to burst into life, suddenly it flags and it goes because it's not been able to breathe, basically. Roots need oxygen, and that's what happens. So, yeah, if you've got problems with uh, drainage, then I'll spike the grounds around it, that kind of thing. Um, make sure that, that it's, the water's not sitting. So really, whatever it's the weather, you're going to be out, aren't you? You're going to be out and about. Well, you won't stop me being outside, Sarah. <laughs> I'll, I'll get cabin fever otherwise. Yeah. It's good for the soul as well. Yeah, it certainly is, yeah. And I love those brisk, wintry days and putting big rosy cheeks on you. And I just really do. I really love those days. So to continue our theme this month on wildlife gardening, Chris met well-known writer, broadcaster and grower Kate Bradbury. Kate is a huge advocate of bringing wildlife into the growing area and we know it's a fundamental part of organic growing. They caught up at a gardening event in a busy corridor and I'm afraid you'll have to hear the muffled roar of traffic as they swap ideas and every so often there's even the slam of a door. But hey, that's the fun of podcast recording. Hi, Kate. Hello, Chris. Lovely to see you. I really appreciate this chat. Good Thank you for your too. time. Yeah. That's all right. So we'll dive straight in if that's all right. All right. So I suppose my first question, I know it's an obvious one, but I'm always interested in this, is how did you first become interested in wildlife? Because obviously it's your, your big passion, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I've been gardening ever since I was a kid, ever since I was tiny. So I've always been outside. I've always been, you know... Mum just used to throw us out into the garden when we were little and, um, and, and so yeah I've always been a gardener and then about 15 years ago my ex-girlfriend's flatmate threw an old duvet into the backyard yeah. it was post student days of not really being very responsible and you know all this duvet smells so rather than washing it or you know taking it to the dry cleaners he just chucked it into the backyard and a red-tailed bumblebee made a nest in the duvet and then their landlord got in touch and said if you don't get rid of these bees I will and we were like what bees and so I got in touch with um, Bumblebee Conservation Trust and I found out all about how to how to move the bumblebee nest we moved it in the middle of the night wow. um, put it in a shoe box with moss and grass took it to the allotment didn't do anything mm. on the allotment that year I just I just used to just go down and just sit and watch the bees yeah it was wonderful and I think then I got a job at Gardens World magazine and because I talked about bees so much, they made me wildlife editor, which then opened up this whole world of, we help the bees and we can help everything else. And then, yeah, I just, I just fell in love with everything. So the connection to gardening came about that then, the job with the Gardeners World magazine, you kind of expanded from yeah, bees outwards so, from that. Yeah, so mm. working for Gardeners, gardening magazines was something that I, I wanted to do before connection with bees. I've always been a gardener, I've always been, Professionally, but, then, yeah. but the leading was the big story. The yeah, yeah story. brilliant. That's a really nice story, yeah. that, isn't it? I yeah. really like that. I've got a lot to owe Johnny. He's that <laughs> yeah, 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 no, that's brilliant. So, was it? I think obviously it's quite important. I'm a Londoner, so I like garden small spaces. Is it yeah. possible to be a wildlife gardener in tiny gardens? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, I live, you know, I've got a 40 foot garden, um, with, and I'm one block off the high street, you know, and, and, and I get, I had a small copper butterfly in the other week, which is quite unusual in an urban area. 
Um, you can do anything. You can have a window box, you can have a, a door step, you know, you're outside your front door, just grow a pot of lavender and some crocuses and see what turns up. You can do anything. I mean, you can't cater for slow worms on your doorstep, oh, yeah, yeah. but you know, but you can cater. They can't be bitch, you can attract, you yeah. Can, you, can, you can cater for insects and, and that's really important. So yeah, everybody can do it. No, it's brilliant, because that's nice to know, because sometimes I think it like it looks like something that other people do who have bigger areas, bigger spaces. Someone yeah. like me who has a balcony, I put up a couple of stick-on bird things, yeah. and, and the place is full of small birds. Yeah. So they come, yeah. they come, basically. They, yeah. yeah, if you build yeah. it, they will come. Just yeah. The yeah, yeah. So how, how important is, I know you're quite big on organics, aren't you? And, I am, yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I read your stuff, and obviously not putting pesticides sides down is an important thing. Yes. Yeah. How important do you think organic is, especially now? For me, organic is the only way forward. I, uh, I grow all my food organically. I've got an allotment. Um, I, I buy all my food organically where possible. And I just think not poisoning the earth and, and not killing pests. I mean, I don't even believe the pests. I don't see pests. You don't see them as pests. No, I, I... I see them as part of, <laughs> part of the food chain and part of, part of the wildlife web. And if they are in pest proportions, if we've got a problem with pests, mm. Then there's something wrong with the with the with the balance, system, yeah. With the balance. Mm. Mm. So I don't tend to get aphids on my board beans, for example, and I think that's because I create overwintering habitats for ladybirds and, and other aphid eating insects on my um, on my lawn. Yeah. yeah, it's you know one of my favourite tweets of yours. I have to mention it because at the time was um you tweeted a picture of a dandelion and there was insects on it and you just said this is why we shouldn't use pesticides because of life. Yes. So yeah. describing it as life is a it's really just beautiful. Life. That's yeah, it, yeah, isn't it? goes on and it's important to yeah. all of us in the, in the bigger picture. And I think for anyone listening who, who really has problems loving dandelions, if you could just not get rid of them between March and May, just yeah. let them flower between March and May, because those are really crucial months for insects where there's not much nectar and pollen around. So if you just March and May and then, you know, go for, go for your life after May. Just obviously. let them flower, because that's obviously a really important nectar source for bees. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And some, bees have, some bees have a direct relationship with dandelions that they don't have with anything else. So... It's all very well to say, oh, well, I, I'm going to get rid of these dandelions because I grow all these other flowers. Well, some bees have very particular relationships and they don't want the other flowers. So there's a they symbiosis. Want, that, yeah, yeah, they want the dandelions. That's really interesting. So in a way, then, I suppose you have to be a bit careful about rallying calls of plant loads of this and plant loads of that because it's not necessarily the yeah. whole picture. Yes, and in fact, there was, a, there was a study recently by Dave Goulson from the University of Sussex in conjunction with um, some, uh, someone who sells some bee friendly plants and um, and they looked at a whole range of plants and they found that the native plants attracted a greater diversity of insects so while you know in wildlife gardening terms we, we've tended to, to 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 look at native and non-native plants and say okay non-native flowers can help extend the season nectar and pollen is just nectar and pollen nobody cares whether they're native or not the insects that is but actually looking at specific varieties it has been shown that the native flowers attract a greater range of insects and so and so by growing lots of natives we can do our bit as well. So in a way I suppose it's important to say that you can still grow all this other stuff yeah. but just make sure you include yeah. the natives in so it. That just, yeah, vipers boo gloss, just grow that in the corner, it's actually really nice to yeah. grow um, and grow it alongside your daily. To include both is, is the answer isn't it? Yeah. I think so yeah. So that's a brilliant tip and that leads me to the next one is mm. what other easy tips could you give? Say if you were a novice and you had a small back urban garden what other tips would you would you give out for wildlife gardening? Uh, so at this time of year in autumn you know traditionally we cut things back we compost everything we chop it up we might put it in the green bin. I've got a rule um, in my garden where I don't get rid of any waste so anything that comes from the garden stays in the garden. Mm. And so at this time of year, I mean, I try as well to not cut things down because the longer you leave your borders intact, the, the more little nooks and crannies there are for wildlife to get into. But sometimes you need to get into a border to, to replant things. Sometimes you've planted, you know, what did I do this year? I planted a cercium in front of a echinacea. And so you couldn't see it <laughs> because the cercium's a lot taller, obviously, um, which was a really stupid thing to do. But I've, I've you know, I've, I've swapped that around now. But yeah, you do need to get in and you do need to replant. And so I create habitat piles everywhere. I've got log piles at the back of my borders. I've got clippings. I, I took down on my um, everlasting pea foliage the other day and I've shoved all that under a bench. There are habitat piles all over the garden mm. and because of that the wildlife has somewhere to go. If you know if there's a caterpillar that um, might have got caught up in any of the things I cut down, it doesn't go into a closed compost bin where it can't get out. 
it's in this habitat pile. And talking of composting, do you remember when compost heaps used to just be a pile of <laughs> clippings in the corner of the garden at the end? Yep. I think, you know, we, we've, we've, we've kind of come away from that, I think. You know, we, most of us keep our compost in, in, on the allotment, yes, we might have bays or pallets or whatever, um, but in the garden we often have closed bins. And I would really like us to go back to just having a pile of waste in the corner yeah. of the garden. It doesn't have to be food waste, it doesn't have to be kitchen waste, but garden waste. Mm. Because you'll get slow worms, you'll get little mice, you'll get beetles, you'll get all sorts of things living in there. You'll get birds picking through the waste. And again, if you cut down things that have got caterpillars on them, or eggs, or in any other insects, they've just got a chance to find somewhere else to go. Sure. Because they don't have a closed bin. I think also, so it, it, with composting as well, compost needs oxygen and needs water. So if you're yeah. sealing it into a container, you're cutting out two of the most important well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I do actually get very good compost from, I do have sealed bins. And but you need to service that, don't you? you need, need, yeah, 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 but you yeah. need to turn it and all of these things. Mm -hmm. Whereas... I've actually got this big pile, which I don't do anything with at all. But, you know, what's turning it is a little field mouse that goes in and makes little holes all through it. You know, that, that's yeah. oxygenated. They'll do it so. anyway. A slow worm will do it anyway. Exactly. And slow worm will control your slugs. And exactly. Your, so you've got that exactly. going on as well, yeah. yeah. Well, you mentioned your allotment. I, I love, I've got on the big allotment here as well. I'd love yeah. a little description of that. My allotment is um, the bane of my neighbour's life. <laughs> <laughs> um, I said to them one time, I said, what are you growing this year? And they said, dandelions, apparently because of all the dandelions on my plot that yeah. are seeding into theirs. Um, my allotment, it's great, I love it. I grow, I grow loads of foods, I grow loads of perennials um, on one side, and then I've got this huge nettle patch that grows all up along the Nettles are very important? Nettles are really important for loads of different species of wildlife. Um, I think six species of butterfly lay eggs on nettles. So we, you know, as wildlife gardeners, we can grow flowers for butterflies and that's really important to provide food which gives them energy but if you don't provide anywhere for them to lay their eggs yes. then they can't they can't breed so I've got this huge nettle patch that goes up along one side I grow docks things that I wouldn't really like to grow in the garden I grow docks I grow butterbur I grow um, bindweed I've got loads of bindweed everywhere bindweed again um, attracts loads of moths and other things that come in um, and, and you, you know, just aphids and, and I've got two apple trees that anybody else would have knocked down. Yeah. They are really old and they, they're just the most cankerous ancient apple trees you can <laughs> imagine. And I just, I saw them and I was like, right, I'm going to leave those there for the beetles. And, um, and, and I, 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 I pruned them so that I just opened up the framework a bit and made them look a bit more elegant as they, as they died. Yeah, I've got loads of beetles, um, loads of beetle holes um, in, in all of the dead wood. And so one day maybe solitary bees will come along and, and make nests in the old beetle holes, which is what solitary bees are supposed to do, but dead wood generally yeah. doesn't happen in yeah. gardens anymore. Um, and then this year, one of the trees just went and produced about 50 apples for right, me. Right, so it's, it's working just, as well. So it's still growing. And so. I'm interested, there's also, because if you've, you've obviously let that natural thing happen, then your P&D problem is you find much, much less. I just don't have one. You don't have one, I really. I just don't have one. I mean, slugs and snails, yes, they are annoying and they're huge and I do we do have a slow worms and I'm sure slow worms control some of them mm. and I have seen slow worms eating slugs and snails before which has been lovely but and we've got hedgehogs on the allotment as well but I think yeah there are things that I don't plant out I don't plant out squashes I lost all my winter no. squashes last year because of the slugs and snails but generally apart from slugs and snails I don't get an aphid problem I don't I don't even get carrot fly I mean no. I get a bit of carrot fly no. but not to the point where you can't eat the carrot Right, so you, you'll get, you're looking for that balance, that diversity yeah. and that balance, basically. Yeah, it's, 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 it's quite exciting. <laughs> it's quite interesting, I find, because when I, I've been a gardener a long time, and obviously when I started here, actually, we're in Brighton, by the way, like my hometown yeah. and yeah. Kate's town, um, it was all about control, it was all about edging mm -hmm. and bedding, and, 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 and there's two reasons it's changed. One is we've, we've evolved, I suppose, as, as yeah. gardeners. And not economics plays its role, but it's yeah. just now how um, you find people that you, you've got to kind of let them to, get them to let go a bit, haven't you? Just to let them go a I bit. I think that's the, the, the thing is to relax. And even I, as a wildlife gardener, still, you know, I will, I will go outside and if something's covered in aphids, I will panic. And I want to, you, you just have that instinct. You want to look after your plant. So an example that I often use is um, I went into the garden about a year ago and my cardoons were just completely covered in black fly. And I was like, oh, my <laughs> cardoons. Um, and I was like, no, you've got to leave them. Wait, yeah. And I waited. And then next to the cardoons, I was growing fennel. 
Mm. And so when the fennel started to flower, it brought in all the hoverflies. Mm, yes. And hoverflies, as I'm sure you know, lay eggs, most of them lay eggs on uh, aphid colonies. So I was watching the aphids on the cardoons. So I was watching the hoverflies mating, coming into the fennel, mating, laying eggs on the aphid colonies. And then there was this wasp called the Ictemnius wasp, uh-huh. which is this really cool wasp that looks like it's wearing aviator sunglasses and kind of moonwalks. And, um, and that eats hoverflies. So I had this kind of three stage. Right, this little stage. This little, yeah. this little food chain going oh, wow. on in this tiny terrace backyard in the middle of Brighton next to the big Tesco. And it was just all, it was brilliant. It was better than telly. And I was just, just sitting there and just watching what was going on. Well, I, I think it's interesting because uh, what you've hit the nail on the head there, because I think that. Um, it just having a look is what it's all about. If you yeah. get out and you look what's going on, it's, just, it's a wonderful place to be the garden, when, especially when you're exactly. little wildlife into it. Yeah. Exactly, and I think too many people see broad, see aphids on their broad beans and they spray them before they're actually checked yeah. to see if Even if it's just with soapy water, yeah. it does, you'll stop that chain, you'll won't stop you? That chain. And yeah. the thing is, is that the ladybird larvae are probably already there. Yeah eating the aphids that they're probably that those 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 controllers those natural controllers are probably already in place and so just by a relaxing and b looking properly and learning what the predators look like yeah you can you can save yourself a job you can learn something in the process mm. which is really interesting and you can have a nicer cook yeah, so the whole idea as well as the fact you just take time out and be in that space yeah. and, and just get rid of yeah. the pressures of modern life, exactly. isn't it, as well? Yeah, so it's all a win-win. Exactly. Well, if you want to know more about Kate's work, there's a brilliant book. You can tell me a little bit about the wildlife gardening for everyone and everything, because this is an amazing book, and this oh. will start people off, won't Thank it? Thank you, Chris. Yeah, it's, um, it's called Wildlife Gardening for Everyone and Everything, and it's designed for people with tiny spaces up to people with large spaces, and you can do a little thing or you can do everything, and it's just a, a, just a guide, really. And there's, there's some good ID pages in there as well for you to actually learn what these things look like. For things like the bees, it's amazing. Yeah. I, all these years I've been gardening, I wonder what that bee is. I wonder what that bee is. <laughs> Suddenly I feel like I've got a point of oh, reference. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. it's really good. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time to Thank chat you, to me it's for, been for Garden Organic. Thanks for having me. Excellent. See you again, yeah? Take care. Cheers. truly inspiring and I love the duvet story but also I love Kate's enthusiasm for us to learn about our pests and their predators so that we can support that valuable life cycle and if you want to get hold of Kate's book it's called Wildlife Gardening for everyone and everything. Now it's time to open the Garden Organic post bag. As always we're joined by our resident specialist Dr Anton Rosenfeld who, like Kate, also enjoys spending his time watching pests and diseases. Welcome, Anton. Hello. (laughs) And Hannah, over to you for the first question. Thank you. Um, So the first one is a compost-themed question. Um, So someone's written in and asked, when they're tidying up dead or diseased plants, they're never quite sure what's safe to put in the compost heap, and can we help? Well, I would say if you are in any doubt at all, don't put it in. Um, There's a number of reasons for that. Um, A domestic compost bin doesn't necessarily get that hot, so it's quite likely that any sort of disease material could actually survive on some of the plant material in your compost. Even if your compost bin does heat up, there's often the chances that there are sort of cold spots in there, and those can be sort of areas where the disease can still be carried over. Can I just clarify with you Anton, you're talking about fungal infections aren't you that can go on living on disease material, on on dying material? That's right yeah I mean most fungi do actually need some sort of living thing to actually live on that um, they they need some sort of plant material but they a lot of them can also survive on sort of dying material as well are they capable of dormancy is that is, can fungus do that they, they are they can remain dormant there are also other types which can form resting spores which don't actually need any any plant material around um, club root is one of them very that's why it stays in your soil so for so long even when you haven't got any brassicas or around so that would be a complete no-no on the compost definitely and it also needs quite high temperatures to break down it needs at least 55 degrees which your compost bin's not likely to get up to that sort of temperature and tomato blight okay say for instance this month 
you're stripping out your tomato plants because you've collected the last of your green fruit. Plants on the whole, as long as they're healthy, you can put them on the compost heap. But yes. if they've got signs of blight, you'd say probably not. I'd say probably not, especially fruits, because the, the disease can be carried over on the seeds as well. And you might end up growing sort of blighted plants next year as well. So any of these materials, I would put them in my green waste compost bin for the council to take away because they will then be sent to a commercial composting operation which gets a lot hotter than anything that you can sort of produce at home. It's mainly just because they're a lot bigger so they heat up a lot more and they will get up to temperatures which will destroy any diseases. So I remember on the parks years ago, you'd have we'd sterilise the soil on a big machine. It's almost like a rocket, and they put them through, put it through yeah. that, and because it can control the temperature, then can't yeah. you? Know, yeah. So you know it's been sterilised. Err on the side of the caution is what you're saying. I would say so. Yeah, if in doubt, leave it out would be. <laughs> yeah, that's a good <laughs> expression. Yeah. yeah, I'm picking up a lot of windfall apples at the moment, and of course they're bruised and and brown, and I've always put them on the compost heap, but. Again, be wary just in case it's brown rot. Yeah, just ordinary sort of breaking down is is okay. Apple apples will break down, but if you've they've, you've got signs of the disease brown rot, where you get that sort of brown app, sort of mummified apples on the trees with the white spots on it, then I would definitely not be putting them into my compost bin. Okay, and one final one because I, I I think listeners might find this quite helpful because we're all doing it at the same time of the year. Um, is the the yellow brassica leaves? Yellow brassica leaves should be fine. I mean, they're just ones which are just dying off naturally, so they they can go in no problem. Great, good. Thank you, Hannah. Does that? Yeah, that, that's really it's really useful. Thank you. And um, so our second question is your question, Sarah. <laughs> Sneaking this one in, thinking we won't notice. So I'll let you ask it. <laughs> well, thank you, Hannah. I have to say this one comes from the heart. I've had an attack of allium leaf minor in my leek patch and it is absolutely devastating because all the plants, first of all they went curiously twisted the leaves, then when I looked closer they were clearly showing signs of rotting and when I went to pull one out just the leaves came off and left the white growth down in the soil and they're nesting within the leaf and within the white area these little tiny they look like little brown grains of rice but they're little pupae is that right anton that's right yeah um first of all you you'll get the little white maggots they've they've got no coloring on the head and no legs as well which is distinct from the leek moth which has give similar symptoms but they, they are sort of little caterpillars with a dark dark head so that's how you can tell the difference between them what, what I'm going to say to you Sarah is that you're very lucky that you've escaped it this long because I first <laughs> had noticed a problem on, in my garden in Coventry in 2011 so you've had about sort of six or seven <laughs> well, clear years without it it still hurts Anton though it's still gutting um so just to say a little bit about this pest it started off in an allotment in Wolverhampton quite a while back I think it was even about sort of 2002 that it's started off I might stand corrected but that's roughly about the time it started and and I've seen the sort of progress of this pest it was sort of a big problem on allotments in Birmingham to start off with and I've just seen it gradually radiate out basically it's spreading around the country now it's a big problem in London I think a lot yeah. of people on my allotment site have left growing leaks alone because they've had so much hassle with it so it's quite prevalent I think oh that's new mm. to me oh well it's reached the, the deepest corners of Oxfordshire <laughs> no leak soup on the table yeah. unfortunately which is a shame because a fresh leak is absolutely gorgeous isn't it if you manage to grow something oh, yeah. yeah Chris have you ever seen this it affect any other alliums like the I, ornamental I, ones I haven't no, obviously I grow a lot of ornamental alliums but I grow them on the balcony and I've never had any hassle with that I don't know whether that's because of my altitude or what reason that is yeah. but I've not, not really had any trouble with decorative alliums that's for sure Mm-hmm. And Anton, how, what would you advise for me to do to prevent it coming back next year? Well, there's a few things you need to do. First of all, sort of clear away all the material and make sure that you um, don't grow alliums on that spot next year because there can be some carryover. Secondly, they tend to lay their eggs mostly in the autumn from about sort of September to November. There's just like little, little flies. Um, so you need to really have a sort of fine mesh netting over your over your leaks at that period that is the only sort of bulletproof way of of protecting them there is also a sort of period of egg laying in the early spring in march as well so that can actually hit the leaks when they're quite quite young so but that's not nearly as much as the sort of autumn period 
So those those are the two two main main things: clearing the stuff away and protecting yes. your crops. So it's a bit annoying, really, because it's another crop you've got to add to your list that you have mesh netting over. So it's, it's not the prettiest stuff. It's, is it's it, not really. It doesn't look nice in your garden. So. Could you could you start then? Could you start? I know a lot of gardeners like to start their leeks in a greenhouse in the autumn because they like to quite get a quite a strong plant before they plant them out. Could you start them in a greenhouse and net them in the greenhouse? Would that help? Yeah, I guess. I mean, if you are growing doing them really early, you would need to net them when they're in the greenhouse, which might make it sort of sort of logistically more difficult. To, to do as well once you've got it is there anything that can be done or is that that is that your whole crop once you've got it you're not really very nice to when you harvest your crop and you're having to sift out all the sort well, of it's, maggot it's, puke okay. <laughs> you're absolutely right and it's exactly what I did and I think from a, a three rows of leeks I got one pretty much just one bowl of soup you know because there was so much infected mm. stuff and I didn't put the leaves on the compost heap yeah um, Referring back to the last question. Okay, well, I'll warn my husband that leek soup isn't on the menu next year. So our third question is about ponds. So someone's written in saying they're thinking about making a pond in the garden. Does it have to be large to encourage frogs and toads? I would say probably not, because in my understanding is that both frogs and toads are happy with something maybe just a bit bigger than a metre or two in diameter, which isn't actually huge if you've got room for it in the corner of your garden. And I certainly think it's a brilliant idea, whoever asked the question, um, because I've recently been talking to the people from Frog Life Campaign, who are very keen that we should put ponds into our gardens. Apparently, over a third of our ponds are thought to have disappeared in the wild in the last 50 years or so. And those that remain are probably over 80% are thought to be in poor or very poor condition. So the amphibians that rely on these water bodies to breed and to live are really, really being stretched in terms of finding a pond to do this. So if you've got a corner in your garden that you can make over to a pond, I do recommend it. And if you go to the Frog Life website, they're running a lovely campaign called Just Add Water which is music to a whiskey drinker's ears, but also probably music to the frog's ears as well. Chris, you're quite hot on ponds. Yes, yeah, so I, I think that um, there's one thing to say is if they're very small, what can happen is if they don't get any sunshine, they can get very algaed up quite quickly. That's one issue you can have with a very small pond. Um, access for frogs and toads is quite important as well. They, you know, Putting some rocks, laying some rocks in so they can move in and out of the pond is quite important too. If, however, also there's always the problem of young children. If you're a family with young to- toddlers running around, a pond's not a brilliant idea, but you still want to encourage wild- uh, wildlife. A few years ago, we did a um, big Blue Peter thing where we made a bog garden instead of a pond. So the exactly the same principles uh, applied. We dug a hole, shelved it, put a little shelf in and dipped it down, lined it with um, sand and then put a butyl liner in, like, exactly like you would a pond. But instead of filling it with water, we punctured it with a fork and we backfilled the soil. So And then we put a few rocks in and a few marsh marigolds and now you've created a bog garden and that was incredible for wildlife, because obviously you get frogs can hibernate under the rocks, you get springtails and wood lice and spiders and centipedes and millipedes, and they're great for little kids to come and lift the rock up and go and look at wildlife. So if you haven't got the space for a pond or you're worried about toddlers, there's another way to encourage wildlife, frogs as well, into your garden. And I must admit, we did a, one of those on Blue Peter, and we literally got like 6,000 letters of kids out there doing it, so I know, I know it's popular. Oh, fantastic. Mm. And what about maintenance? Once you've made your pond, how much care and maintenance do they need? Well, I think it's really important that you put oxygenators into it because that will get you around the problem of it turning into soup as soon as the sunshine comes out. So you might want a plant called, there's one called Elodia crisper, which is a floating plant which will keep the balance in the pond right. And I think there's plenty of, of native plant life that would be appropriate in a pond. I think be careful if you're buying non-native plants. Some of them can be very invasive and I know that DEFRA, for instance, have a list of plants that you really should not be growing because if they escape they will devastate other plant life. I, I would definitely look towards the natives. Like something like the marsh marigold is a brilliant plant and it attracts loads of... Th- and a water body is going to encourage insects, birds, it's not just frogs and toads. You're going to get a wonderful mm. array of wildlife all through the seasons as well. Fantastic. And I know that we've got a lot of advice on our website. I mean, we've got a video on YouTube, which you did, Chris, and, and some instructions on how to make one. So Yeah, go for it. Just add water. <laughs> brilliant. Thank you. our time is up and thank you for listening. I hope our chats have been interesting and inspiring. In truth I'm conscious that we've only touched on the huge but lovely subject of encouraging wildlife and there's so much more we could say on the subject. 
Organic growing works with nature. It's not about saying no, it's all about saying yes. So in the next few months, we'll be talking more about how and what to grow alongside the wildlife in your plot. Now, next month we'll be into the Christmas season. So not only will Chris and I be listing the books we'd like to receive as presents, and you may like to drop some hints to your nearest and dearest, but we'll also have an extended interview with Jane Peroni, the country's houseplant guru. Jane's wit and wisdom will inspire you to get growing indoors. And don't forget, there's lots of advice on all the topics we've been talking about today on the Garden Organic website, www.gardenorganic.org.uk. Our thanks to Kevin McLeod for providing the music.